um, proud Lions, uh, Lions legend, I'd like to say. Um, played for Hampshire, Durham, and Somerset. I hope I haven't missed any of the of the other teams. Um, but your test record, um, 58 matches, um, 3,253 runs, and an average of 37.4. I'd like to remind everyone that is opening the batting. Um, and um, a little bit in the beginning, I think, as a middle-order batsman. Um, and then uh, ODI cricket, 64 matches, 1,688 runs, and an average of uh, 37.5. Um, but for, for, for our young players out there, to be able to get those numbers, you have to achieve a lot in first-class cricket first. And you're sitting with 280 matches played. Um, you're just under 20,000 runs, which is, to be accurate, 19,000 and 41 runs um, at an average of 45, um, 45.8. So I'd round that off to 46 for you, Mackie. Um, and then list day cricket, 298 games at eight and a half, well, eight and a half thousand runs um, at an average of 37.9 with a strike rate of 73. And then your T20 cricket was 155 matches, um, if I'm not mistaken, and it's uh, 3,000. 357 runs at 33, um, and your your strike rate was 118. So, just looking at that, um, you have a lot of knowledge on on how on how to bat. Um, you you obviously ver were versatile enough as as a player to to adapt your game to be able to play all three formats, um, and and to to play them consistently at international level. Um, and and yeah, so welcome, Neil. Um, thanks again for 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 taking some time to to come share um, a couple of stories with us. I've heard a little whisper through the press that this is only the first edition of two, where you'll be sharing some presentations and some some stuff that will add to the coach's toolbox. Um, so yeah, over to you. Welcome, mate. Thanks, Sia. Thanks to everybody for having me. Uh, Jamila, thanks for organising. So it's a little bit late, but. Uh... The technology and myself, we, we're fighting at this stage, but I'm on and uh, ready to go. No, no. So, so let's let's get to it. Um, in terms of, and I'd like you to reflect on on both because we might have a couple of, of of players that are aspiring to, you know, I hope some of my 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 central Gauteng Lions players are on here. Yeah? Um, but they're aspiring to to make it in the game and to grow and. And and I really want to hear from both sides. You know, if you could share from a playing perspective, and perhaps as a, from a coaching perspective in your in your journey as a coach now. Um, and the first of the topics is: is technique overrated? And in your opinion, why? Um, no, I don't think. Uh, you know, I think. You get a different perspective as a player and a coach. Um, I think, you know, the biggest thing I'd like to sort of, if I ever sort of took quite a few young players, actually really try and push them to, to coach. Um, I think you start looking at your game as a sort of a holistic background. Um, you know, there's quite a few things that, that I change. I think as an international sportsman in cricket, you're reading out those numbers. There's a few that I like. There's a few that I don't like. Uh, there's a few that I, I think I left out there. So you always... Yeah. Um, this is, so can you switch off your thing? Uh, sorry. Um, can you turn off your, your, your video? Okay. Can you hear me, sir? I can hear you, but I can't hear Neil. Oh. Okay, I think he's also frozen from my side as well. Okay. It's okay. It's a good start. At least we're not pressed for time so much. Yeah. Um, uh, try to run through the questions. So, so we'll wait for him to, to connect. Um, I think his missus is also online. Um, if I'm not mistaken, so yeah, I think he's okay. He's back on again. Okay. Sorry, guys. 
It says Niels during the meeting, so. Um, I just want to see. Um, yeah, are you recording? Uh, no, you are. Yeah. yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, so Sorry about that. Technology. We're fighting at the moment there. This Wi-Fi and load shedding is messing with all the wi all my uh, Wi-Fi. Um, no, no so, yeah, worries. So as I was saying, in terms of the technical, yeah, as I was saying, in terms of the technical side, I used to believe that you know um, mental was a was a lot more than than the technical side. Uh, you know, I think they're equally important. You know, I, I don't think it's the textbook uh, technique in terms of that, but it's knowing your technique. It's knowing yeah. what you want to do. And we know we know confidence levels and uh, trust in your game plans and that are, are highly important in terms of your mental side. But how do you yeah. how do you get to to that to that mental toughness? And I think the biggest thing is guys that are mentally tough trust themselves but they trust their technique. Yeah. So it's like it's like driving a car. You know, you can only go 180 if you trust that you 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 know what you're doing behind the vehicle. And I think the biggest thing there is, uh, you know, technique for me is definitely not overrated. I think when you become quite analytical, too analytical, um, and you start falling back only on technique, I think that's that's when the the, the issue arises. But you've got to know your technique. You know, you can look at a, a player like a Graham Smith and everyone will say, geez, he didn't have a great technique. But he had the best technique for Graham Smith. He's six yeah. foot plenty. He's a tall guy. He plays the ball really, really late. So when you ask him to play a forward defense on a Sunday club game and on a Friday in front of, in front of a full house in a test match, he trusts, he trusts his technique. He trusts his forward defense. Yeah, and mentally, when you start trusting your trusting your uh, your technique, mentally you get into a good place. You know, it's the same yeah. as uh, cricketers and, and batsmen trying to. Um, you know, we want consistency the whole time. So there's routines, there's superstition, which I definitely uh, I think you should leave out. But you get <laughs> routines to get you <laughs> to get you consistent. You know, and yeah. that's the same thing. You know, we want consistency. But if your forward defense or your drive is in different positions the whole time and under yes. different uh, um, mental constraints, you know, you're not going to be in a good position. It's the same as playing the short ball. You know, the short yeah. ball, and I've seen a lot, I've done a lot of work with the Bangladesh players. Because they play on their wickets, they get in such bad positions on the front foot. Yeah. So because their wickets are slow, they keep moving their front foot forward even though it's a short ball. You know, so that's yeah. a technical flaw that's hampering them mentally. You know, and we've done yeah. a lot of work on these guys in actually showing them the technical flaw. Yeah. Showing them, showing them players that play really well off the back foot and and sort of get out the way and what that front foot is doing. So that's a technical uh, adjustment. And on the mental side, it's helped these guys completely. Now all of a sudden they've got more time because they're not jumping on the front foot. They're staying on top of the ball, and we've got other options. They, you know, yeah. you don't have to hook. There's the ramp, the, you know, there's the duck, yeah. the leave, whatever. But technically, they're in a lot better position. So mentally, they're really, really good as well. Yeah. No, thank you very much for that answer. And I really want to want to go into this a little bit more with you, um, because it seems, you know, that, you know, at under 19 level, and age group level. The subcontinent teams are adapting, um, but there is a bit of a gap when the guys get introduced into test cricket where they still have to figure it out and, and how, because the game happens so much quicker and the bowlers, you're not facing balls that are below waist height there. Um, you know, so, so and I, I, I really get what you're saying. So for you as a player, you speak about techniques and you grew up, you know, you went to Cares, you grew up in Joburg where the wickets are bouncy. You probably, at the beginning of your career, played a couple of games on, on, on either side of the slopes at the Wanderers, um, which can be challenging as an opening batsman. Um, and, and so how did you manage to adapt in international cricket when you had to go from, well, when you came in and you were in the middle order, but you've been an opener for most of your life, and then adapting when you came back 
to being an opening batsman? How did you manage that? Was there a technical side to it that had to be changed or adapted? And or was there was it just mainly mental? Yeah, I think my start of my uh, test career wasn't uh, too too promising. I think, you know, as a 23-year-old, uh, as you said, brought up on the half held wickets, I went to Sri Lanka. Um, unfortunately, I got 197 in a, in a warm-up game, and uh, they decided to choose me in the test match. <laughs> so I probably think that's probably my worst 197 I've ever got. <laughs> so uh, they decided I'm in good form. So the only place that was available was opening. That was the first time I've ever opened in my life. And, you know, it's the first time I've seen the ball spin. You know, uh, like Mura Lutheran came in there, and I was all at sea in terms of that. You know, uh, I think... We don't get the footage and the TV coverage that we do now. So we didn't have access to seeing who did it well, who played him well, how did they play him well. So it was really just left to your own devices there and finding a way. Um, technically, nowhere. And I think mentally sort of shot. But the more work I did on the technical side of things, and this is going back to my last point, the yeah. more mentally comfortable I was that I could ex execute my game plan. Yeah. And... Um, you know, so so that sort of role and learning in international cricket, um, you know, it's a tough place to learn. You know, and I think you, you've got to adapt to all the all the surfaces, but you've got to have good mentorship going through, showing you the basics, and then you adapting yeah. your own game to the own own wickets or or the own or whatever you're going to be um, sort of uh, encountering, whether it's big spin, leg spin, you know. So I think having that having that sort of information available on how you can be successful, um, what you need to do to get successful. And, and I think that was, that was basically it when I, when I got my second chance in the national side to open the batting, you know, there was a few uh, um, sort of things I had to sort of change. And I think mentally, I didn't change too much technically, but I think on the mental side, um, you know, you know, I'd always been going in number four or number five where you sort of walk in by yourself. And I quite enjoyed going in uh, with a partner and, and taking the focus off me a little bit um, and just worrying about getting the team off to a good start. So I was yeah. patient. I didn't worry if I made ugly runs. Uh, you know, I'd been three years in the wilderness. So ugly runs, they were runs and I, I was playing for my yeah. country again. So it was more just a mental shift. Um, you know, just to bat time, um, stay in your game plan, um, and obviously just bat for, for for the team. Get that new ball old. And uh, whereas at number four, you sort of walk in there, you're the main batsman generally, and uh, yeah. you're looking to get yourself in and then dominate, where my first focus was more just that platform, laying that platform. Um, and then obviously, you know, trying to play the ball as late as I can uh, in the different conditions. And... You know, luckily enough, uh, the first the first test series was Bangladesh, then India. So you want to be an opening batsman there. Um, yeah. You know, and, and then you got to adapt. You got to stay a little bit leg side, and you know that took a bit of um, sort of doing. You know, like you say, you're playing at the Wanderers on the slope where you want to try and cover the ball. So you, you know, yeah. it's like driving a car. You don't want to be driving the car here at the Wanderers because you don't know where yeah. where those where, where the road is. So you basically yeah. want to be in line and then judging how you drive a car. So at the Wanderers, yeah. you know, you want to go onto off stump. You want to leave really well on that channel, anything outside your eyes. Where in the subcontinent, you've got to be outside the line, sort of giving yourself a bit of room uh, where you yeah. can really play the ball later and, and, and use. So, you know, it's just the different conditions and, 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 you know, that's what you get for traveling. So like these under 19 tours that go to India, the SAA tours, these, emerging tours you know they're all very instrumental in 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 getting you like the indian spin camp you know getting our yeah. young players to feel it for themselves you know you can you can you can give them the know-how like i was talking about earlier you can give them the know-how but they've got to be able to feel it yeah so so oh have we lost you we still got you then neil okay cool yeah, yeah. Um, so so i'm sure a few people listening coaches and players will be really interested in the in the tools. And you kind of sort of briefly poked into the skills and the tools that you may need as an opening batsman in in various parts of the world. So I want to start, and I'm quite biased, but I believe that, you know, I've never played at that level, but if you watch guys opening the batting in franchise cricket, 
when you were playing, I mean, you had some serious bowlers playing in the in the franchise circuit or uh, provincial circuit then. What are the skills you need? And it's the toughest part to open the batting in South Africa. In South Africa, it's, you know, it bounces. It also still seems a little bit more. So it's a mixture of potentially England and Australia um, in one. And so what are the tools does a young player need um, that you can share with us to to be successful as a as a top order batsman in this country um, and and around the world that they can take into the international space and what are the tools do do you believe that a coach might need to have to to be able to teach and advance that player to grow? Um, I think the biggest thing about sort of opening the batting and sort of doing really well is. You know, I try and keep things really, really simple. Um, you know, the guy's got to know his technique. As I said, it doesn't have to be the textbook technique. So for a coach, it's 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 learning that player's language. You know, if you talk to Quinton de Kock um, and Hashim Amla, it's two con- diff- it's two completely different coaching sort of uh, techniques that you sort of adopting for for both players. So it's really being flexible, but it's it's knowing your player. I think the easiest thing is knowing your player's technique. Uh, if he's got a trigger, what does he do with his hands? What is he thinking? Because that's your buy-in straight away. You know, if you see something that's not there, you can say, hey, uh, Dean, I saw you lifting a bat to Gully now where it used to go here. And, and this was your this was your good 100 that you scored. Look where your bat's going. Already you've got him in your corner or you or he wants to sort of impart knowledge. And, and it's basically getting that sort of information where the guy actually wants to open up to you. Um, so for me, the technical side is really, really easy uh, or easier. Uh, knowing what the guy does, what makes him tick in terms of the technical side, practice, what do you, how he prepares um, in terms of, you know, where we try and try and prepare for what the guy's going to be facing. It's no use. If he's going to be playing at the Wanderers, we try and simulate. If he's going to be playing yeah. against Mitchell Stark, we try and simulate what he's going to be facing. And giving yeah. him cues like, okay, if you get through the new ball, he swings a back bank, and then he'll go old ball from around the wicket. So it's basically yeah. just preparing him so there's nothing that's going to jump out to surprise him, you know. Yeah. Uh, playing against the off spinner, you know, like, okay, he's going to be coming over the wicket to start. When you're dominating him, these are your scoring options. When you're dominating, don't be surprised when he comes around the wicket. And all of a sudden, when yeah. the guy's playing there, he starts doing well, and the guy comes around the wicket, he says, geez, I'm winning this battle. Um, yeah. the, hardest thing for, the hardest thing for me, and, you know, I had to learn slightly the harder way where, you know, I was a head head player in terms of technical side. So I always believe balance, head to the ball, and I always played like that. So when I coached or when I started coaching, I was very much just, guys, push your head forward. And some guys didn't didn't sort of take to it because that's not their batting language. So a guy like yeah. Quinn de Kock, his batting language is sort of hands and flair, getting his yeah. hands up. Um, Hashim Amla is, you know, he wants good balance in his feet. Uh, a guy like Faf Duplessis, he's only thinking left shoulder. And yeah. although they all the same same technical position you know we want all the guys in the best technical position possible to defend to attack and that's the consistency yeah. but how do you get there some guys get there i got there with my head a guy like uh, faf duplessis gets there with his shoulder you know so yeah. in my coaching it, it was a big eye opener for me to actually w- work with a guy like faf who's very technical Technique or technically orientated, so it actually freshened me up. And and you know, we had a couple of sessions there where I'm thinking, geez, I'm not getting through to this guy. It can't be this hard, you know. Uh, your head yeah. goes forward. It can't be this hard. And then the next day we chat about it, and he says, no, he's thinking shoulder. And I went away. I started practicing, had a few throwdowns with my shoulder. And all of a sudden, geez, I'm in a great position with my shoulder, you know. Yeah. So it's definitely finding that that cricket language for for. It. For the individual, um, you know, whether he's a hands guy, whether he's a head guy, whether he's a yeah. shoulder guy, whether he's a feet guy, whatever it is, because you can get guys in the same position but talking a different language to each individual. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. That, that, and then just and just on the, and and then just on the batting, in, 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 you know, to be a, I try and simplify things. That was my original sort of conversation. Is that good test players? They do a few things really well. They know. Their off stump is, you can defend well, whatever it is. So you've got to know where your off stump is. 
You've got to play the short ball well, which doesn't mean you have to hook, pull, and cut, but it mustn't get you out. So a guy like Hashim Amla, he was he was probably average against the short ball when he first started, but it didn't get him out. So he looked a little yeah. uncomfortable, but he had he had a bit of guts. He had a bit of well, lots of guts. He hung in there and he found a way. So the short ball can't be can't be getting you out. You don't have to look pretty at playing it, but it can't be getting you out in terms yeah. of a mental side of things. Like you know, when Bangladesh come here, we know. The short ball gets them out. Before they even walk on the pitch, they see Mornay Morkel. They see a few guys there. They're already asking the coach, you know, in the in the reception area, is Mornay playing? Is Dale Stain playing? So yeah. that's what I'm talking about in terms of that short ball getting out. And good players and the great players, they put the bad ball away. You know, and that's as simple as it is. You know, um, my other, you know, those are the four points for me. Is yeah. Sort of knowing where your off stump is, which will, which will make you, in, get you in a good position to play the ball late. Uh, put the bad ball away. Uh, don't let the short ball sort of uh, disrupt what you're doing. And and the fourth thing for me was sort of cash in. You know, so yeah. I, um, I come from CARES. The the mathematics department isn't the, the best there, or maybe we don't need it that well. <laughs> but uh, I only learned very, very late. Well, not I, I learned a little bit later in my career. When I first had my first stint with South Africa, you know, got a good 80 under pressure. Then I'd get a bad ball, a bad shot, run out. I'm averaging 30. You know, the quality players, they're not better than me in terms of, of, of skill and whatever, but they when, they when they going was good, they made it 160. So yeah. 160 with a bad decision, a bad shot, whatever it is, now they're averaging 45, 50. And, yeah. and that's that hunger, that's that sort of, Staying in your game plan, being mentally tough just to, you know, you know, when you're 23, you want to show off a little bit, you're 80, oh, I'm playing the next game or whatever, where the real quality champions, you know, they make it big. They make a big play for themselves, for the team, for the country, and turn those 110s into a 180, a 220. So, you know, that that's the hunger level. And just, just putting those bad balls away, you know, Test cricket, uh, it, you know, every every level you get to, you're going to be getting more balls, bad balls. So at club level, you'll get four bad balls or three bad balls and over. I'm just, this is just a yeah. hypothetical situation. Franchise level, you get probably a one and a half balls, two bad balls and over. Test level, you might get, if you play against the Australians back in the day, you probably only get half a bad ball every over. And if you're yeah. not going to be putting those balls away, it's going to be a long afternoon for you. So you really okay. got to find a way to hit those bad balls for four. And, and you look at the great players, you know, they can get beaten a couple of times. All of a sudden, you bowl them a bad ball, bang, four. Because they're technically in a really good position and mentally, they're in a good position to take care of that bad ball. Yeah. That makes sense, you know. No, absolutely. Um, so so this links up, and, and you've dropped a couple of breadcrumbs for me to pick up on here. Um, in terms of being able to bat long periods of time, Occupying the crease, yet still trying to score and get your team out of a bad situation. 2008, July, at Lords, beginning of the summer. Talk us through the nine and a half or nearly 10 hours of batting. I think it was 400, 400, <laughs> nearly 450 balls. Um, what, what, sure. how, do you, how do you train that one? And how do you get into that, that, that space, the, the, the telephone booth, the zone, you know the uh, whatever guys call it these days. How do you how do how do we coach that? You know, teach that character. Besides the four points that you have brought up, there must be something else that that can help you achieve something like that as a as a young player. Because I'm sure you didn't just do that once. I think you might have done it a few times in domestic cricket, um, and 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 maybe at school cricket or or something. How do you train that? And how do you go back to those resources under pressure at Lords, home of cricket? Against the palms. Sure, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good memory, but it wasn't a great innings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I like the I like the numbers without the facing how many balls. No, I think you know the biggest thing for me there is is you know you're playing for your country, um, you know you got a job to do, and basically we couldn't win the game. So for me, it was all about game plan. You know, trusting my technique, uh, trusting my game plans. You know, so th that's the, the the point I alluded to a little bit earlier in terms of you know guys trusting themselves. So if you're in a technically a good position to 
to to defend and attack. You trust your game plan, and your game plan changes on days. You know, sometimes you get to a ground and it's a little bit wet, and your game plan is to hit the ball late and drive. You know, to trust yourself to say, well, you know, today's not a driving day. You know, you play in England, April, May, and June. You, you've really got to tell yourself in terms of that game plan to say, like, you know, it's going to be tough today. I'm going to have to drop and run rather than than drive and, and then see how we go. So for me, that sort of innings was just about, you know, the fight for South Africa. Um, but mentally, my game plan or the game pushed me into that game plan. It had me sort of saying, okay, well, no, you know, it doesn't matter how many you get. It's about how long you can bat you. So, yeah. and it was a good wicket, um, you know, and it was all about, okay, well, I'm not going to play any expensive drives. I'm going to have a little uh, check drive. When they bowl the short ball, I'm going to rely on instinct because I've always done that. Um, I don't need to be fishing for anything outside off stumps. So if it's not on the stumps, and, and you know, that's why I come back to, you've you got to know where your off stump is. So I yeah. set up there with that off stump thinking, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to try and flick one for four across my pads. I'm hitting everything straight. And for me, it was just sticking to that game and, and not being satisfied. You know, I think I got out actually when I thought the game was, was safe. Um, I think I tweeted a little hamstring as well. I thought the game was safe and, and I had a little <laughs> prod at Jimmy Anderson, which, yeah. you know, in my mind, looking back there now is like I've been batting for a while, but I went outside my game plan. And yeah. because I thought it was safe. And that's what players do. You know, a player gets, uh, I've got some runs here. And everybody's got that run count, you know. Everyone's got that, okay, when I get to 40, I can start expanding. Or, uh, you know, I've got 100. And how many hundreds do we see? We see 103, 104. And that's where players yeah. go. They go against the game plans. You know, so all of a sudden, oh, I've got runs. Now I'm going to play. I can go after a little bit more. That shot. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all about sort of getting into and, and, and the zone. It's for me, a zone is more about trusting that game plan and just doing things over and over and over again, just consistently. So if the ball's there to be driven on a Sunday premier league game, it gets driven. If it's there to get driven in a test match, it gets driven. Uh, your yeah. game plan doesn't change in terms of when you've discovered it and set it up to say, okay, well, this wicket requires me to bat like this, that's my game plan and I gotta to stick to it. You know, and then yeah. you know, as coaches, you know, I gotta look at how a guy gets out. I look at the process on on, on, on the build up and I look on mentally so to off a drive and a ball's bounced on him and he's got caught at gully. I'm not gonna to go to say to Hashim Amla, listen, it wasn't a great shot. You know, that's not a good yeah. shot for me. But that's that's Hashim Amla's shot. So for me, it's about knowing the guy's game plan. And if he's gone outside that game plan, that's my problem. So if a guy like Hashim yeah. suddenly never hooks and then all of a sudden has a hook at something, I've got to look at what were those processes that made him uh, have a hook. Was it over yeah. uh, overconfidence because he had got 100? Was he under pressure because they dotted him up? Or was he scared? And, and that's coaching we try. If a guy gets out in his game plan, happy. If he gets out doing something that he normally doesn't do, then we look at what were the processes leading up to that. Yeah. No. No, that... that sorry, I'm just losing you there, Neil. Got me. Just... Sorry, I just, just became a bit distorted. The elements of of a... Uh, of ESCOM and uh, are fighting against us here. Can you hear me, Mackie? I can hear you. You good? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Super. So, so I think what what you've actually addressed there is, and it's something that I grapple with a lot at at national weeks, um, or when you watch school sides, you know, coaches, maybe that is where an opportunity is to learn to control your emotions when an error does happen in a game um, from a batsman or potentially from a bowler. Um, what I've seen and what I see a lot of is poor kid player gets out. He's walking to the pavilion. The, before he's even gotten in there, he's being asked, what are you thinking? What are you doing? But 
there's no time to actually process or understand what his game plan was. So maybe that's an opportunity for us as coaches to give that personal space to the player to be able to address the matter to you when everything's calmed down, when the emotion of the disappointment um, and the failure or the error is, is out of the way. Um, and then you can ask the necessary questions to get the player to give you that feedback so you have an opportunity as a coach to, to understand it. Um, so I think you've just given us something there that is very important um, with regards to the, the to being out of character when things go, when a mistake happens, is it within the character of the player or is it outside of the, the, the game plan characteristics of that player? Um, so thank you for that, um, Mackie. That, that I want to go on to the next thing, but I may I think we may have touched on it. So technique versus tactics. And how do the two marry each other in your mind as a batting coach? Yeah, I think, again, they, um, they're very sort of uh, closely related. Um, as a game, you know, you can have the best tactics in the world. If, if I say to all the guys, listen, we're going to take on Nathan Lyon, to, Lyon today, all the right handers. And, you know, I believe that the tactics are sort of sweeping or reverse sweeping or whatever it is. Um, technically, it's probably very good for myself, very good for a, a couple of the guys. But if it's a, a, a tactic of a, of a, of a player, um, another guy in his game plans and, and what he's comfortable with, he's not really going to commit to those tactics. Um, so, you know, tactics, I love tactics. Uh, I think that's where, you know, high performance coaching can definitely, uh, you know, you see the rugby at the moment and you see all the tactics and then against different teams, what they're trying to do. So there's definitely a lot of scope. I think tactics are, are, are in, in, in the game. Um, but, you know, even bowling at the day. You know, so South Africa tried to bowl wide at uh, MS Dhoni. That was one of the tactics. But yeah. if a guy like Chris Morris, he's not comfortable when you do that, there's going to be problems. Because why? He's not committing to that delivery. You know, so we've had a few incidences there where the tactics have been really good. You know, we've seen the highlights, we've seen the reels to say, okay, well, when you bowl wide at MS Dhoni, he doesn't hit you. He doesn't score. You put your field like this, this, that. Is it yeah. Chris Morris's or KG Rabada's? Is it their best ball? Is it what they comfortable with doing? You know, and I think that's where it comes down to captaincy as well, is where when your captain runs to your, your death bowler, you know, and and starts sort of first of all trying to coach him because what is what do we as batters do? If 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 I'm a captain and I run up to someone to and I see four five is up, if I see forty five is up, that's like a weak decision for me. As a batsman, I love seeing that. But I'm not taking yeah. into account if that guy can hit over forty five. So, yeah. you know, emotions get a lot of sort of into play there. Tactic tactics get into play in terms of what you can and can't do. So, you know, you've got to be in line as a coach. Tactic, that's where you for your bread and your name or whatever it is, but you've got to have the players to be able to fulfill. And, and, and that's that learning and knowing what your player can and can't do and what he's technically and mentally uh, comfortable with doing. You've got one ball and it's uh, the World Cup final. Are you going to tell KG Rabada to bowl a wide and he's going to be 80% committed to it? Or are you saying, KG, what are you thinking? And he's saying, I want straight Yorker and I'm not going to miss it, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I'd rather have, I'd rather have, uh, you know, you can have the best plans and not be committed to it and it goes uh, badly. Or you can have average plans, but you commit to it. You've got a better chance of it coming off. Yeah. No, 100%. So, and I, and I like to kind of sum this, summarize this for, for coaches to get um, and, and understand. Um, so, yes, they're very closely linked, um, technique and tactics, but you're obviously not going to execute the tactic if you don't have the technique or the skill. Um, and and we, need a, we need to gauge that as coaches and understand and know our players well enough to know what they're their best skill is their get-out-of-jail shots, their release shot, or 
their delivery that 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 gets them the dots under pressure, um, you know, and so forth. Um, if 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 I'm if I'm understanding you you correctly there. No, hundred percent. I think you know you got to know your players, and, and that's where your preparation comes in. You know, if you're asking a guy to do something. You know, that's where you see where preparation and, and, and the training comes in. You know, you, you don't try and sort of say, listen, this is where I think we could be effective. And then he's got to train. You know, he's got to, he's got to buy into to the tactic, or it could be his tactic as well. And he's got to train accordingly and, and put in the hours or put, put in the graph there. Um, and, you know, to try and simulate those conditions, you know, I think yeah. a lot of guys just go out there and bowl balls and feel like they're okay and then hit balls. You know, you, you've got to be fighting. You've got to be playing games in your head the whole time, you know. Yeah. Even if no one's talking to you, you've got to be thinking, okay, well, I'm not getting out here now. Or I'm going to work on this. I'm going to get better here. And, you know, I think yeah. there's, there's, you know, when, when you train about uh, getting that, 0.1% better every time you go and train, you know, rather or rather go mentally better, sit on your bed and think about what you're going to be doing the next day rather than just hitting balls for the sake of hitting balls or bowling for the sake of bowling. Yeah. So you, you probably, you've done too many of these webinars or discussions. I can, I can, I can tell you fully immersed into your coaching because you've led me, you've led us to the next, next, next point um, out of our topic question. So, Practice, so training versus run scoring. Because a lot of guys um, in our time, um, you've seen it, I'm sure every coach has seen it. A lot of guys are very, players are deceiving, are deceiving to the eye as a coach. So in the space that, that, that I'm involved in, a lot of the coaches that are here involved in, Yogi, now at Kez, um, Vermit Saints and, and a couple of other guys that are involved in youth cricket. Um, you know, what, how do guys do well, look so great in the nets? And you can almost be fooled to think that this guy is going to get you runs as a coach at times. Um, so, what, how do you practice to score runs? How do you prepare that? How do you practice to score runs? Practice to score runs. Because to me, as a coach, I couldn't be bothered if you are taking body blows in the nets as long as you find a way to get one, um, especially if you're an opening batsman for me. You can get off strike, you can leave well, happy days. Um, then then we, we've got a base already. You've got grit and you've got, you can defend and you can get yourself out of jail with a safe single off the inside half of your bat or an ugly single here in front of, in front of point. But... What I really want to know is how do we teach guys to practice scoring runs from your experience, having worked with guys from the subcontinent um, and some of the best players in the world at, at, in the pro tier setup? I think the biggest thing there, and I, and I always come back to sort of those game plans. You know, how do you know your game plan? You know, by doing things consistently in the nets. You know, I think. Too many times you go into the nets and your best mate's bowling to you and you try and whack him for six, you know. Um, you know we're looking for that consistency. So, you know, there's all time to see what you can and can't do. So, you know, uh, every season, uh, Aaron Pangisa used to bowl to me and I'm thinking every every season I run down, try and hit him over mid-on. And every season I put the shot, you know. Sometimes I have to do things and be not successful to actually develop your game plan. And I think, you know, developing that game plan happens at practice. That's the only, only real place you've got. So setting up your, your, your stall, going in there saying, okay, I'm practicing, and we're only practicing, we're batting for 12 minutes, whatever it is. Uh, and that's what I said coming back to you. You're always playing games in your head. So for yeah. 20 minutes, or for, sorry, for 20 balls, I'm going to be as tight as I can. I'm hitting balls late. I'm going to try and drop and run. Um, I'm not going to play anything expensive. I'm going to be check driving. You know, by check driving, I'm seeing how quick the wicket is, if there's bounce, whatever there is. And then, you know, then I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm on 40, 50 now. I'm looking for a slightly. I've been in. The wicket's quite good. I'm going to be driving a little bit more expansively. So, for me, it's developing that game plan and allowing those kids to, to, to develop a game plan. You know, it's no use saying, well, that's a rubbish shot. You got out. 
the whole time. He's yeah. got to learn for himself. Um, you know, so I think 90% or 95% of your net is going in there, setting up your store, doing things the right way. Uh, obviously, changes for, for test matches, one-day games, and T20s. But you've got a manner or a way that you can. So for me, uh, that's where you develop your game plans. And then there's a time to say, hey, coach, listen, I'm going to play a few shots against this off spin and I just want to see where I can hit him and where my options are, you know? Or Aaron Pangiso, okay, I'm going to try and hit him in different options because they bring this guy up to me. Then you, know, you learn. You learn through doing things and getting it wrong as well. And I think yeah. when you know your game plan, and a guy like Graham Smith, he, as a young guy, he knew his technique and he knew his game plan. It wasn't pretty, you know, instead of driving it or, or check driving to cover, he used to sort of wait for it and used to go through midweek. So what it does do the whole time, he's rotating his strike. All of a sudden, he's on 40. The other bats on the other end still sitting with 10, with perfect technique or whatever it is. But he knew his technique, he knew his game plan, he knew where his ones were, and he knew what he was trying to do. So for me, he trained that. He practiced it really, really hard, and that game plan hardly changed. And then yeah. you can add to your game. A guy like Hashim Amla as well, every season he added a different shot because he was happy with his strengths. So he kept on, he kept on um, his strengths, his game plans, but he tried to add on to his, to his sort of uh, slight weaknesses. So as I said to you, the short ball, when he first came on the scene, he struggled with it. All of a sudden, yeah. he sort of practiced it practiced it, had a few hits at, at practice, top edges, and then realized, okay, well, you know, when the ball's here, I've got to hit it slightly softer. The one I can really hit is when it's outside off stump. On my head, that's not an easy one to hit, so I'm going to let that one go. So it's really just, especially for a, for a you know, a guy like Jacques Callis, and I'm throwing some big names around here, but a guy like Jacques Callis, you go watch him play. It is... The same thing over and over again. You know, he'll go in there, barn door. Once he feels good, then he'll play some expansive stuff. Uh, but yeah. that game plan, setting up, doing the things that you trust that your game plan's right and you can trust your, um, you know, I, I think a big example for us is when the South Africans go to the, the subcontinent. We don't trust that we can run. We don't trust our defense. So what do we do? Yeah. We try and sweep. We try and do, because we're not trusting that process. You know, for a right-hander facing a right-arm spinner that's coming in, he shouldn't be getting you out. You know, yeah. in terms of when I say shouldn't be getting out, he shouldn't be getting you out somewhere around the bat. If you're going to take him on and you get caught mid-wicket or get caught in the deep, that's different. But your technique yeah. should be so sound that you know and trust it. But our guys haven't stood there a lot. They don't trust their technique, and that's when you see decision-making coming to play. And that goes back to my game plan now. So, if I see a guy yeah. like Duke Plessis running down the wickets and getting getting the ball inside, I know that's not his shot. So I can have that discussion with him and say, okay, what are you thinking here? And he can't uh, bullshit me because I know yeah. he's playing inside out. So I know that, you know, that's not a pain. So, you know, and that's where your little sort of softest missiles come in. For me, soft is when you've gone against your game plan. Yeah. No, I fully agree with you on that. And, and thank you for answering that because sometimes, you know, guys get lost in the, in the understanding of when the firmness needs to be there as a, as a coach, and especially with developing cricketers. Um, guys, well, I mean, I think as a cricketer, even when, you, when you're 37, you're still developing a test level. But just with the young guys that, that are coming through in our system, and I said this the other day to someone that, you know, everyone keeps saying that our system's cricket is weak and this and that. Uh, I, I, I tend to disagree. I believe that our system is young and we've got to coach a lot. So us as coaches have a lot more responsibility on our shoulders because there isn't a, a, a 34-year-old Kempi in the dressing room sitting there telling a young franchise guy how to go about his business and mentoring him at training. Our system is genuinely completely young. So we as coaches have a big part to play at age group level, at school level, at club cricket, in the provincial academies to really physically coach these guys, roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty and really lead the way. 
Um, and I see we've got a couple of questions now. Um, and I just want to, maybe you can help answer some of these. Rashad Fuller's asked, how do you implement a game plan? And we've said this a lot because I guess, you know, you speak the same language, you're in, in coaching, but there's various age groups and levels of coaches in, in this platform. So he's asking, how do you implement a game plan to a 12 or 13 year old um, and, and maybe the understandings for them? Yeah, I think um, it's not an easy sort of question to answer when you haven't seen the, the individual. Um, but I think for the younger guys, I think it's understanding what they can do and can't do. You know, I think as a 12 year old, is the guy a tall guy, is he a short guy? Um, what is his shots? Uh, where is he looking to score? Uh, what, is, what is his strength? What is his weaknesses? You know, um, you know the biggest thing for me, you know, when you when you're coaching a, a 12 year old guy, um, you know, you get big 12 year old guys, you get small 12 year old guys. Um, for me, it's trying to get them technically in a good position uh, that they can execute whatever you will execute their best game plan. And by that, I'm saying is like, sorry, I think I lost you guys. Yeah. No, but no by that, I'm saying is like, is he, is he, a, is he a hooker? Is he a puller? Um, you know, is, is he a big driver? Um, you know, for me, technically, there's a lot of work to be done with a 12-year-old. Um, you know, getting him into a good position, uh, getting him to feel, uh, all right, well, that's playing the ball late. So I think on the 12-year-old side, the game plan, yes, it's, it's, you know, the quicker you can develop it, but it's more about seeing what the guy can and can't do and actually understanding yeah. that, okay, well, you, you know, these are your strengths, you know, that's where you're going to get your runs, but we want to try and work on this um, and, and try and manipulate, you know, South Africa, you know, got so much talent. You know, sometimes you talk to a 12-year-old, you can tell him exactly where to hit it, what he's looking to do. His game plan's already sort of set, where another guy, is, he's still learning, he's still growing. Um, his game plan's going to change, his technique's going to change, his scoring areas are going to change. So for me, a 12-year-old, I would try and, try and just sort of enhance his strengths and build on that and then sort of try and build up his weaknesses or, or perceive weaknesses. But for me, the biggest thing is getting him into a good position where, you know, he can play the ball late. The, the biggest thing is he's just playing the ball late because it tells me you're in a good position and he'll adapt that game plan, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, you, you can always say to him, well, okay, well, you're waiting for this delivery. That's where you're going to score this ball. You're waiting for this delivery for here. This is your danger ball. And, you know, it could be where you get three different color balls and, and you obviously got to be skilled as a coach to throw where if a guy keeps on playing across the line and getting LBW and bold, you know, that might be the blue ball. Then the red ball is his scoring areas. The yellow ball could be a, a defending. You know, and then he gets used to that. He gets used to seeing that blue ball where, you know, it's not a four ball. It's, it's, it could be a four ball for Joe, his best mate, but that's a get out ball for him. So when he sees yeah. that ball, his game plan, his mental side is saying, okay, well, that's trouble. So I'm just going to get bat on ball there. And I might have missed out on a, a, a four or whatever it is, but at least I'm still batting and I'm going to score off my, ye my yellow and red ball. Well, my yellow ball is a drop yeah. and run. You know, just just a silly yeah. example like that. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense to everybody, but yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. I think obviously with guys that young, you're right. You just you want to keep it entertaining and interesting, and and obviously a game a game within a game probably keeps keeps those players improving and wanting to come back. Um, so it, it, I I think it makes sense, and I hope it uh, it answered Rashad's uh, question there. Um, Pete Van Royen, uh, Kez, uh, first team coach. How do you manage to get, and this question is quite funny, because someone asked earlier on in the lockdown, we asked Chubby this question <laughs> about how does he, how do you manage to get across what you want from Bangladesh batsmen with regard, with, with, with the challenges of the language barrier? So I, I want your answer. I don't, I don't want to go into Russell's answer. <laughs> Chubby's answer is a little bit left field, but I'm hoping we'll get a decent one from you. 
Well, well, let me tell you about Chubby quickly, and we've got a, a couple of 30 seconds. Anyway, he got to Bangladesh, and we were chatting there, and he said, Neil, do you want to say to anything of the batters? And I started, like, you start, and, and you learn it, no disrespect to the Bangladesh guys. There's a lot of guys there that speak English, but there's, there's like, in the squad, you probably got half that understand you and half that just nod their head. And um, anyway, so Russell went, you know, gave me the floor, and I said, guys, good ball, keep out, bad ball, nice and positive, uh, stock, reverse, hit straight, and I just broke it yeah. up, and I could see him, like, giggling to the self in the, co in the corner there, you know? And uh, <laughs> so I went to him afterwards. He said, geez, like, bud, and your English, that, that's putrid. What's going on here? <laughs> so anyway, so we started laughing. Anyway, so Shakib uh, Alassane came to Russell after he did his speech, and uh, Russell was talking, and, uh, you know, Russell said, what do you think? He said, yeah, 40%. So he said, what do you mean 40%? He said, I think most of them got 40% of what you said, <laughs> what you were talking about. <laughs> so now what I do is I video call, record him sometimes, and I see Russell. Uh, good speed ball. Uh, <laughs> we try and take out all the, all the words. Uh, but luckily enough, uh, uh, batting is a, is a universal sort of language where, you know, I, I'm quite – demonstrative uh you know this sort of coaching for me um is a bit foreign i like a bat in my hand uh sort of very sort of animated uh, behind the stumps or in front of the stumps um you know and you yeah. know just try and get a lot of visual with the bangladesh guys as well and you know i think as i said we've got we've got a really good anal uh, sort of analogy guy there that sort of videotapes their sessions and we break it down so a lot of visual and uh yeah I, I try and take out as many uh words that the guys don't understand as, as possible and they do the same with me i can pick up a bit of bangla uh, but they've got to break it up and talk nice and slowly but russell <laughs> I, I might have to send you guys i might have to send you one of russell's talks <laughs> <laughs> no, no 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 i've had i've had one with him with the sl19 and it was uh, the one speech that i can remember i probably forget most of lawrence's ones but Chubby's ones was, uh, it was like we were in a franchise dressing room that day. The players were <laughs> eyes were this big. <laughs> you Oaks are useless. There was a soft performance. And the guy's like, what? <laughs> we want to nah, play for nah, South Africa. <laughs> so, nah, so, he's, yeah. he's a good man. He's, he's good sense of humor. Good man, I think, yeah. I enjoy it. I enjoy him a lot. So we've got a question from um, Marlene Hlip here asking, um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, when you go through a long, long periods where you, where you look good and feel good in the nets, but you fail to execute that in a game, how do you get yourself to carry on going and and believe that you will score runs in your next match? I mean, we we live for that as batters. It's, it's okay, the next game, the next game, even if you're in a bad run. Um, but how how did you deal with it, and how do you get guys that are in your space as a coach to to understand that it is around the corner? Um, yeah, I think that's that's mainly what she's asking us. Yeah, I think that that's a tough one, and that's obviously that's that's playing cricket and, and being a batsman. I think the biggest thing is that you know that you're going to have a little sort of rough patch. Um, the quality players get out of those rough patches a lot quicker. I think mentally we always believe, you know, like we we are the sort of uh, eternal optimists the whole time. You know, you one one score away from a hundred, you one score away this and that, and you know, it can, it can work in reverse as well. Um, you know, when you're going really, really well to actually not be thinking, oh, that bad one's coming. You know, uh, I think, okay. you know, to stay hungry. For me, it goes back to how you're getting out. Are you lucky or are you going against your, you know, are you going against your game plan because technically you need some work where, you know, you've got to put some work in technically in the nets or are you you're going against your game plan because, you mentally struggling, you know? Yeah. And I think, as I said, te technique and mental are, are very closely related. Um, but for me, I would be judging or looking back on my innings to see if I executed my game plan. And if I executed yeah. my game plan and got out, I've got to believe that that 100, that 200 is around the corner. If i really honest with myself and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know what? I didn't exactly execute my game plan. I went against my game plan. Um, some guy chirped me or, 
the conditions were a little bit green or this was happening or I was fighting with uh, whoever, um, you know, yeah. then I'd be quite, quite, quite sort of aggressive with myself or, or cross with myself. And, and I think, you know, finding out, especially as a player, you know whether you've gone against your game plan, you know whether an outside circumstance, whether it's overconfidence, underconfidence, whatever it is, has happened. So for me, the best players, they keep things simple. They keep things the same. Um, if it's a technical flaw, awesome. You can fix a technical flaw quite quickly. If it's a mental flaw, you've got to look at yourself and, and, and sort of reevaluate your game plan. You know, and I yeah. think the biggest thing as well is like sort of trusting that game plan because the good players trust it. They know that, they know that if I keep trusting that game plan, it's a matter of time before the runs come. The problem comes in is when you chop and change. And you know what happens all around the world. You know, your your under nine coach, how are you playing for the South African side? Your under nine coach, he drops you an SMS because he thinks he's doing you a favor. He's like, uh, no, Neil, I remember when you got that uh, 100 against whatever, your back lift was higher. Now you go to the nets, you put your back lift higher and you mess around with that back lift for another week. And that doesn't help. Then you go back to your original back lift. Then you go to... You know, some other guy will say something and then you'll go back to an, another technical. So, you know, yeah. you've really got to, you know, you want to be prepared. You want to be sort of take in what you can take in with, with the, the different advices, whatever. But it's your game in the end of it. And you've got to trust yeah. that game plan, know your game plan. And I think that's where the good players, they get out of it. They don't waste two, three weeks or uh, waste 10 practices trying to do something that only because they've gone through a bad patch. You know, if, yeah. if Gary Kirsten has gone through a bad patch, um, he doesn't suddenly change his, his whole technique. He doesn't start look, looking to hit balls in different positions, you know. Um, so for me, like, he knows that I stick to that game plan. It will work. Let me check the video footage. Is there any technical flaws? No, I'm still doing the same. Uh, all right, game plan, let's execute, and let's try and execute that game plan. Yeah, no, 100%. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. It, it made it crystal clear for me. I hope it uh, it helped uh, the the um, Marlene there to understand the, the answer there. So Itai um, has asked an, a question here, which which also I, I, I'm interested in this answer. Does the length of of a batting session have an effect on the ability for a player to bat longer? And would you prescribe volume or intensity of practice? You know, so does it have an effect? How long you bat in practice? Um, Not when you're about well, to think... retire. It's okay. You probably didn't need a hit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I think the more you can hit you know, the better, but, but not just hitting for the sake of hitting. So definitely it's like Preseason comes out there. No one can sort of prepare you for a day standing in the in the field. You know, you've obviously got to prepare for it. Um, unfortunately, there's there's normally 13, 14 other squad members that also want to hit. So it's not always about about you. Um, yeah. So you don't get that volume. So yeah, no. Flip. If you can get the volume in, and there's bowlers and whatever, I think it definitely helps because you're spending more time knowing what you can and can't do. Are you testing yourself all under pressure? But for me, you know, the intensity has to be there. You know, I'd rather have a 10-minute high-intensity net than a half an hour no-intensity net. Um, mm. and, and as I said, to go back to my first point, is that 90% of the time, you know what you're trying to do. You're trying to sort of get that game plan and execute that game plan under pressure. And under pressure is not always in the nets, but if you've got that intensity, you've got guys running in at you, asking questions the whole time, you get that intensity, you get that belief, you get through a, a really tough net, playing the way you play, suddenly your memory bank in your in your back of your head, you're thinking too, well, technically I was good, but mentally I was really good because I got through it. So in the back of your head, you've got those memory files that you've done it, uh, you trust it. You know, and a lot of young guys would say, well, listen, I don't trust myself. I'm going out there. All of a sudden, I play a flashy shot. You know, do you do that at practice? You probably do that at practice. You know, yeah. and I think that that's that's that practice uh, sort of in, intensity that you want and, and 
you know, why are you hitting balls? You know, what are you getting yeah. out of that net the whole time? So if you can get the volume in, awesome. Uh, but you've got to get the intensity in. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, thank you for that, Neil. And, I, and I've, I've, under, I, I, I've tried to stop using the word intensity um, because with, with, with players, the players I'm working with, intensity is a word that they just throw out there. Yo, coach, I had good intensity. And I'm going, okay, tell me what that means. What, what does it mean to you? No, coach, I was, I was moving my feet quickly and, and this and that. And I'll get, okay, tell us more. So I've started trying to use the word quality. So was the quality of your thinking good? Were you getting into good quality positions to leave and to defend? So, you know, and 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 I I really appreciate how you answered that because it really it's triggered me because I wanted to find out a bit more about do I need to throw more balls to certain players? Because certain players don't know what they need, which is another challenge at at youth level. So top of session, quick little share here for 30 seconds. SN19 side, my batters all say, send me a message the day before. This is what we'd want to do. This is how long I need. Okay, 30 minutes. He needs a hit for 30 minutes. Let's make an example. John O'Bird says, Coach, I just want to face the bowlers for, for 20 minutes. Um, and then can I go on the stick with you for 10? Perfect. That's your 30 minutes. The poor player or the poor bowlers are still bowling. 45 minutes into the session to the same guy that said he wants 20 minutes. <laughs> so, so my question is to the player is, what's the quality? What are you getting out? No, but I'm, I'm, I'm out of Nick now. I beat myself out of Nick. Because <laughs> well, you went over the 20 minutes, but I should have been 20 yeah. minutes. Yeah. You hit a couple nicely, get out of there. It's a top up. So uh, you're right. Quality, volume is always good, but the quality of the volume really does count. Yeah, I think you did right. I think every every player will, and it's hard when you've got under 19s, whatever, to develop. They still they're still learning and developing their game. Um, but the biggest thing there would, you know, like, and I always sort of come back to it is like getting that game plan right uh, with the intensity, with the quality, whichever one you're talking. But your game plan, you know, too many guys go out there. And I guarantee you, he goes out there, and he nicks off a couple of balls. He plays one or two big shots. He might have got runs the week before. He plays one or two huge shots in the nets. Gets out now. He wants more batting. Now, for me, that that's a no-no. You know, yeah. You go in there, you set your stall up. You know, if you go in there and say, "Listen, I'm going to try hit over the top for the first. You know, I've only got five minutes here. I really want to develop some hitting areas. I want to work on this." And you get out a couple of times, no problem. But don't come waste everybody else's time especially when you've only got bowlers, when you don't have the resources of the national side, we've got, you know, net bowlers coming out of your ears. Make sure yeah. that you don't waste anyone's time. You go into the net to get that 0.1% better. How are you going to do that? You know, are you going to get out five times trying to do something, but it's advancing your game? Awesome. Or are you just going out there because uh, I SMS uh, uh, the coach to hit a few balls, but I nicked off one or two and it wasn't in your game plan. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't know how to reiterate that. That game plan for me just comes back to the game plan, you know? Yeah. No, it's, a, it's a tough one because, you know, uh, here's another question. I mean, it, it, it links to, 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 to the coaching side of, 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 your, of your work now, which is since being involved in the subcontinent and, and mainly practice and play in, in Asian conditions, what have you learned or taken away to go, how to go about playing spin? And what can we as coaches do to assist our players going about playing spin? <laughs> it's, it's the most asked question. <laughs> have, have, have you got about 10 hours? This is, this is where I prefer to be uh, sort of uh, with a bat in my hand and, and talking. Um, you know, listen, the Bangladesh guys, when I got there, I, I was sort of very taken aback to, you know, how they played spin. Um, you know, I, I was thinking they'd be... Uh, you know, they, they were going to be a lot better in terms of the spin. I think one day cricket, they, they, they're really good. But test matches, um, in terms of that spin, you know, just, just their thinking and, and where they're looking to hit the ball. Um, I think, you know, the biggest thing for me is that when you're facing the ball coming into you as a spinner or when the ball coming away, it's two completely different techniques. You know, we talk about guys playing seam and quick bowling and we talk about spin. You know, I, I think it should be quick bowling, uh, swing bowling, and then you've got your ball turning in and your ball turning away because they're completely two different techniques. 
Yeah. You know, I think, you know, the, the easy the easy spin is the ball coming into you, setting up, you know, to to, to that to that offside. Um, you know, you want to be going with the spin without taking your options away. You know, I think quite a few guys, you know, they talk about people hitting into the spin and doing this. You only hit into the spin when it's really over pitched or when it's a slow Score. wicket and it's really back of a length, you know? Yeah. And I, and I think that's the perception is that, you know, in, ter- in terms of, I, I prefer to have a bat in my hand showing you what I'm meaning. You're uh, itching. Uh, <laughs> I can in. see you die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, for, for me, it's, it's setting up your body to go with a spin without taking it away. So I can give you an example, a guy like uh, Aiden Markram, you know, unbelievable talent. He sets up the same way when he's facing the ball turning away and the ball turning in. So in South Africa and Centurion, you can get away with it. So he hits the off spinner through cover. Now you go to the subcontinent and try and hit the off spinner through cover. And we see now that works for him. So for yeah. me, it's not to take away his quick feet and the cut against the off spin, but he's got to be setting up technically to go with the spin because when it's his best ball, he wants to be ahead of his pad over the top Going with the spin, when it's yeah. slightly short or he sees something that's that's not that that's not there or something that's there to hit, he can still jump on it either side of the wicket. You know, same as you know, you can when the ball's turning in, you can be a little bit closed because you're going to be. I'll turn my seat here, so you can be a little bit closed and covering yeah. your stumps because the ball's going to be turning. So that's your line. Your head obviously never this side of the ball, always sort of there. Yeah. And then when it turns, you sort of can move and open up. Now, when it's the left arm spinner, you want to be slightly more open with that open foot because you want to be, your head must never be this side as well. And you want to be static and then be able to adjust and go through the offside with the spin. And, you know, um, yeah, so it's hard to, hard to describe there in terms yeah, of that. I can so, picture that, yeah. Yeah. And, and the biggest thing for me in, in the South African uh, context is that we're still on the move when the ball gets bowled. So when we play seamers in South Africa, you'll see most, most guys' feet, if they've got a trigger, they bang, bang, and the ball gets delivered. So like a Hashim Amla, bang, bang, ball gets delivered. We're very still, and we can play. Now what happens in the subcontinent, when they face uh, the, the, you look at the Indian players, whatever, when they used to face the seamers, they used to go bang, bang, and still moving at our seamers. And that's the Bangladesh. I call that the Bangladesh front foot because they're not yeah. in that, Static position, yeah. point of delivery. So at point of delivery, I want the guys to be sort of static. Now South Africa, in reverse, subcontinent guys, when you face the spin, they make that movement already. So as at point of release, they've already got that front foot down. Now they've got time to move. Our South Africans, we make a trigger, whatever it is, and as the ball coming out the bowler's hand, our front foot's still moving. Now we haven't got time to go back onto our stumps. When yeah. it's short. So you look at the quality players of spin, your AB de Villiers, whatever. All he's got is at point of delivery, he's just got this little dip with his feet slightly wide open. Yeah. That allows him to transfer his weight forward and back. Mm. So so generally, if the guys are coaching spin, you know, I'd be throwing to spin at the guys like this. And at point of delivery, if I hold the ball, I want to see that front foot or whatever the triggers they've got. I want to see a good position. And the guy's been able to get forward and back not still coming forward at you because that's limiting their options. I don't know. Has everyone got that technically yeah. wise? No. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, okay. So one, one tour to the subcontinent and a couple against them here. And I want to ask you the same question I asked Raul Dravid. I said, trigger or forward press? Against spin. <laughs> because those are the two trends that you, you can, see a lot in South Africa. And I'm trying to find out. Yeah. Tri- I'm not even speaking about standing still because that's what I'm for. And I think if guys can just stand still, then at least they can pick up the flight and the line um, for the of, of the ball. But guys don't want to be static all the time. So do you go trigger or forward press and when? Yeah, I don't think it matters, trigger or forward press. I think it's the same thing because like a forward press is a trigger. For yeah. me, it is a point. It is a point of release. 
you know, we we go when the bowlers bowled, our guys are still triggering or still moving forward with that forward press. I mean, you can get a forward press in um, too early, then you have to move again. I'm saying at point of release, most of the South African players, especially the young players, is when the bowler bowls, the subcontinent guy, as he's as the ball's coming out of his hands, that bowler, I mean, that batter, whether he's standing still or triggered, he's, he's either made the move, he's made the forward press, or if he's standing still, I guarantee you he's got a little dip. Yeah. So his feet are slightly wider, he doesn't have to move again. And when I say doesn't have to move again, he doesn't have to adjust. Now he's only looking for length. He's looking for line yeah. and length where our guys are still on the move when they're looking for line and length. So when the ball's out of our hand, the ball's now the guy's doing that and our guys yeah. are still moving. And that's too yeah. late. So for that's me, it would be setting up to play which, it would be setting up to play which ball, which which of the, the, the spin is going, where, if it's going away from me or if it's going uh, um, into me. Obviously setting up the two different techniques, but it's really being static at point of delivery. And that's statics not standing here because then you have to move again. Statics sort of getting into that position exactly how you're facing a seamer, but at a seamer, you bang, bang, ready for action at point of release. But because yeah. it's a spin, we think we've got more time. At point of release, after the ball's left the guy's hand, our front foot's still going. We've got the Bangladesh front foot in reverse to the seamers. So yeah. for me, it's just getting that little crouch position. And, you know, a good drill for us is actually... Um, when I try and talk to some of the guys, is like get them into that feeling. Is like, okay, make as if you're balking. So like, as the bowler bowls, if I said to you, listen, act like you're going to charge this bowler, but just slam down your front foot or dip or do whatever you do. Yeah. That's the position you want to be in. Because as the bowler bowls and you balk, bang, you see it yeah. slightly short, you can get back onto your stumps. And that's what we want to playing spin. We want to get depth on the back foot. So if yeah. we're hitting from the crease, you know, you're normally playing hitting from the crease here. Now, if you're back on your stumps, you're giving more time for the ball. Now all of a sudden you can turn instead of a back foot punch, you, you're turning into a back foot slap because you're getting the ball yeah. a little bit higher than, than, than you would be expecting it. So at, on the yeah. crease, the ball's hitting you sort of on the knee. When you're back yeah. on your stumps, it's hitting you above the flap. And now yeah. you can, especially for one-day cricket as well, now you can get really back, rotate. You can get on top of it, hit that little uh, gap at between cover and point. So so for me, a good telltale sign is when that guy gets that book and it's slightly short, I see him all the way back on his stumps. Yeah, push and right back. it's short and he goes back, push back. If, if he's still on his crease, that means his foot is, is, is going too late or it's gone too early and then it's moving again. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to show you like <laughs> batting. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. It's just um so so with with that is a little little situation or debate that we have in our schools and under nineteen system. That look, let's be realistic, the guys don't face the quality spinner in under nineteen at an under nineteen World Cup or in a bilateral series that they they're facing Tommy who probably bowls you know, a couple of right arm rollers and he's just trying to stop an end and they're going to get three bad balls from him and over. They go to a, a international side and they play against a guy like Bishnu who spins it both ways or and, and he bowls 85 kilometers an hour. There's no flight on the ball. How do these young players prepare for that? How do they plan for that? How do they... What position does their bat need to need to be in? Because that's another thing is our guys are saying, coach, but I can't even get my bat down in time. And I'm going, well, why can't you get your bat down? Why do you feel like you can't? No, he's he's bowling like 115 kilometers an hour, leg spin. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. what happens yeah. in the subcontinent. That's what those guys do. They different. But what I'm wanting to know is if we've set the feet position up nicely now. You want to be nice and still, all right, with your little nice and early, but just in time to press so you can move forward and back. What position do we want our bat? Is the bat down in the setup for the spinner, or is it still a uh, typically high South African back lift? 
Well, I think, I mean, with, with that, I like to call it a set. So I don't call it a, a trigger or whatever it is. I don't get involved in anyone's trigger. If they want to trigger, they must trigger. If they want to press, they must press. So I, I say get into a set position. So your set is your ready position. Like you can move forward and you can move back. So if your legs are slightly too close together, you can't move forward and back. You're going to push forward, then move back. If, you, if, you're sli if your legs are too wide, you can only sort of get a little stumble going in terms of going yeah. that thing. So what is your set position? So, so for me, that, that'd be a good, like when you said the quality instead of the intensity, uh, I've written yeah. that down. I've, uh, I'm going to use the quality instead of the intensity, but that set position for me is the big yeah. thing. So I keep shouting at the Bangladesh yeah. batsman, set, you know, that's, that's all I have to say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for me, everybody's different with that back lift. But if you set and you're in the set position, you're ready for action. You're in the best position you can be in. So I don't care. For me, I've got a small back lift. But if I'm in my set position, my front shoulder is slightly dipped, I'm ready for action. Um, a guy like uh, who else who's got a huge back lift, um, you know, if they've got a huge back lift, if they're in the set position, their hands are in the best position they can be. So for me, it's not, you know, put your back lower because the guy's quicker. You know, I think sometimes we coach what we what we don't see. We we you know, if you make a small adjustment to someone's technique, there's a knock-on effect. And yeah. I think that's where you've got to know the technical guy, the technical side of a guy is that we looking and he's saying, I'm not quick enough, my back lift's too high, whatever's happening. It's not your back lift. Your front foot's still going forward. You haven't got your set position. Because if you are in your set position, your back lift is gonna be in the ideal position for your technique. And what you've trained yeah. for, and what you've, what what makes you bat. So for me, yeah. it's just that set position, um, you know. And I, then I think in terms of, you know, when you're facing these, the, the, you know, I've seen some of those under nineteen, uh, uh, under nineteen, uh, uh, not sure, under 19 <laughs> but uh, sp spinners. Um, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, I'll tell you a story, a few stories there, but uh, yeah, so they. <laughs> They're quality spinners, and it's that learning curve. It's me going to Sri Lanka, never facing Moore Lutheran or never facing a spinner like that. Never seen things like that before in my life. But, you know, it's, it's getting that preparation. That's where you as a coach you say, guys, this is what you're going to be facing, you know. And then it's getting uh, a Merlin machine or it's getting a leg spinner to come off 16 yards instead of 20. Uh, it's getting that preparation. It's digging up a pitch. Uh, it's, it's scratching a, a wicket. It's going to the, the side of the, to actually try and simulate what that guy's going to be facing. And, you know, yeah. for him to really get into that position, that, like, do you understand that that set position on this, this is the worst pitch we've ever prepared. And if you've got your set position in a good position here, you, you, you're going to be okay for the next guy you're going to be facing. Like, yeah. uh, you know, one of the subcontinent spinners, that's what, that's what he does. And that's the preparation and the, and the foresight and, and having those facilities and your, your resources at, at your disposal to actually make that coaching difference, you know, having that footage to yeah. say, okay, listen, this is what he does. He goes leg, leg spin, leg spin, leg spin. His danger ball isn't the leg spin. Like you're facing him onto here. You know, this guy's been around yeah. for forever. He's got 500 first class uh, teams he's played for. But the guys don't yeah. know that his leg spinner isn't his dangerous ball. No, it's the googly and the slider. It's his slider. So why? Mackie? You still there? That's you. Sorry, guys. We've lost Mackie. Was... Due to load shedding. Yeah, this, this low shedding, it doesn't seem to be kind. Eh? I thought we were on a good wicket there. We were just getting to some nice conversations about the technical side of batting. It, 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 it's funny. In fact, I'm sitting here thinking, this is good stuff. This is seriously good stuff. Um, I hope that we'll get him back as soon as possible. Um, yeah, because I've got... I've got is, it Sean, is it Sharnay's question? Um, and then... I would like to. Then there's Knowles um, and uh, Mark, and then yeah, uh, yeah uh, Coach uh, Piet van Royen. So there's some good questions here, and I think I, I'm hoping that there's some really good insight for guys to take away also. 
<coughs> my notebook is filling up here because uh, it's some same here. really valuable yeah. info. Mm, same here, and I hope I definitely hope because I'm I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, as I listen to to you having this conversation with Neil, I'm having goosebumps here because I'm thinking this is good stuff. This is quality, um, and I hope obviously the coaches are picking up one or two things. And I think these are the, some real good questions. Oh, here he is. Yeah, we've got him yeah. back. Sorry, guys. No, no worries. We understand you. The, the bills need to be pay, paid to to ESCOM. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I actually lost it. I went into another conversation with uh, with Mr. Scuddy there, and I, I forgot where we were. Um, but uh, I think we're uh, no, just saying yeah, preparation. Just, yeah, yeah, preparation for for these types of players. Yeah, I mean, just they've got to find their way. You know, you've got to prepare as much as you can. It's going to be uncomfortable. Um, you know, you, you've got to sort of simulate what they're going to be facing. Uh, so it's not a surprise. Were bigger surprise than when they get out there. You know, my, my, my first ball I got from Mur Lutheran, it was my first test match, and I, I was facing a spinner in the eighth over. You know, I've been watching test cricket all my life, you know, <laughs> all around the world, and I'm thinking, yeah, I've got the seamers to come, and maybe just before lunch, I'll face a little spinner there. Now, eighth over, this guy's on, and he's just spun one, it's hit me on my bum, and I tried to play a <laughs> shot, and I, and I ran through. The umpire told me no shot. I was like, Phew. It's going to be a long afternoon here. Yeah. <laughs> so, I actually no, was no. trying to defend that. I just missed it by about a, a half a meter. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so let, me, let me go. We've got a couple more questions for you. And and I'd look, just chatting to Dumila briefly there when we'd lost you. Um, this is invaluable information. This is, you know, and, and as coaches, the, this lockdown has created a great opportunity for us to, to really connect because I think, it was each person sitting in their own dugout and worried about themselves and their, their team and what's going on. Um, let me just check here. Shawnee. Becky, you still with me? Yeah, I can hear you. So Shawnee um, has asked, when preparing to, to play in, a, in, in different conditions, what, what are the processes to go through as a coach? Is the focus mainly on the different physical conditions or mental toll it will take to overcome the conditions uh, and get and get the best performance. An example would be playing the subcon in the subcontinent as to, compared to playing in in the high felt. Um, well, obviously, I mean, if you're talking conditions, you're obviously talking about about heat and that sort of stuff as well as as the conditions. Um, yeah. I think I think preparation would be sort of for me trying to get footage of guys that have done well against that particular bowler in those particular conditions. Um, talking about, you know, when you go to the subcontinent, what's your main mode of dismissal? It's LBW and bowl. Uh, yeah. So how are you as a player going to take one dismissal out? So I, I, whenever I play, I try and take out one dismissal. So if I'm at the Wanderers, I want to take out the court behind. So what's the best way of taking out the court behind? is to get into line with the ball, wait for the ball to be bowled at me, leave well, uh, take out the court behind. If I get LBW at the Wanderers, I've missed a half volley. I'm prepared yeah. to miss a half volley. I don't want to just get into a, a nick and say, go off and like, coach, that was a good ball. You know? I, yeah. you know, if, if you're saying that at the Wanderers, you're saying that 25 times a season. So you've got to find a way. The subcontinent, yeah. if you get caught behind at the subcontinent, that, for me, is the better way to go than getting LBW because you know the main mode of dismissal is LBW and bold in the subcontinent. So where you set up, you talk about uh, where a guy sets up, okay? Is, are you going to start on off stump? If you trigger a guy, where you want to get to uh, at, 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 the, at the Wanderers, where do you want to get to um, at the subcontinent? And then it's, it's – it's just training, you know, it's preparation, it's video footage behind to say, okay, like for me, when I got a subcontinent, for a guy that never wanted to show my stumps and wanted to be really, really tight, all of a sudden I have to go to the subcontinent and show my stumps. Yeah. And when I was playing, obviously, if I'm slightly uh, uh, on leg stump, now I'm playing sort of towards that channel instead of playing towards that channel. And for me, yeah. it was a bit of a, a bit of a, it was a big mind shift to actually like, that's normally fifth, sixth, sixth stump that I'm leaving at the Wanderers. Now where I'm batting, that's probably off stump and I have to be playing that. So yeah. it's, it's mentally, like, it took me a while to actually say, okay, well, 
that's the way you have to be here. And then mentally, through my technical side of things, where I actually started playing the ball nice and soft on that fifth side or, or on that fifth um, stamp or, or sixth stamp um, in South Africa, in subcontinent, and so on off, I actually started playing the ball a lot later and got a technique where, okay, well, I'm actually quite comfortable there. And then mentally committed to that line and to that, yeah. uh, that technical so, so, I mean, the doing is invaluable. I mean, the preparation, the doing is, is invaluable in terms of that. Um, and then, you know, the big thing is for a lot of guys and the coaching side is, is, that, is that visibility, that sort of coaching through, through a visual. So seeing how a guy like Jacques Keller set up, who had a trigger across, how did he set up? Um, you know, so the heat... You know, you can talk about the heat. You can uh, emulate the heat. I, yeah. I heard uh, a couple of years ago, I think Ray Jennings used to get the guys training. He had to train in three jerseys or something like that. So there's a lot of innovative ways that you can, you can get that humidity there. Um, you know, rotate the gloves every 10 overs, um, you know, which is not always easy when you've got superstitious guys in your team that like to have the same pair of gloves. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of things you can do sort of to match the conditions, but the general batting and the play, uh, that's just visual and, and sort of showing guys how what what's the best way to be effective. And not everyone's going to be the same. Some guys have got different scoring uh, options in terms of, of, of the, the different conditions. But generally, you want to show the guys – the, the basic tool to to be successful and have a successful uh, tour uh, you know touring yeah do you find that our guys get caught up between seam and spin and get confused between seam and spin in the subcontinent and or against spin spinners from the subcontinent so let's say for example it wouldn't really happen but Newlands bad year drought it's dry day four day five it starts taking turn. Do you find that our guys look to play too square sometimes? Because in their mind, they're thinking, well, the scoring opportunities against the seamers are square of the wicket or would be square because I'm inside the line of the ball or generally inside my off stump line. So do you find that players go, they find they don't know how to shift between, shucks, it's the spinners now and I can actually score down the ground against subcontinent spinners rather than trying to hit them sort of in front of point and looking to hit them behind square on the onside off the front foot. Do, do you think that that is a, a mind block or a concentration thing or a, a game plan um, deficiency from, from, from players on, on our side of the world when they go to the subcontinent? I think it's probably a technical flaw, first of all. Um, it's, it's a technical flaw. The guys are not used to it. So the technical flaw comes in that, that, that's still on the move, which, which limits your options. Um, you sort of get caught on the crease and all of a sudden you're not on top of the ball. You have to go across the ball. So for me, it's the, the big sort of thing there would be technical flaw. Uh, I, I love showing guys that technical flaw and showing them what a good position they can get into yeah. when, when they set properly. All of a sudden, you've seen that one-day shot that's come in over the last couple of years is where guys, you drag it slightly short, whether it's uh, the ball turning in or turning away, generally with the ball turning away, because those are the guys that normally just bowl hard into the wicket um, and limit you, and the guys get sort of um, stuck. Now what the guys are doing, they're staying slightly leg side, they get that set early, and then anything slightly short, they're going on that back foot and picking you up through cow corner and that mid on yeah. area so how many times have you seen guys getting hit there and you can only hit that shot by having a great set and getting deep back onto your stumps so a guy yeah. like ab de villiers a lot of the subcontinent bowlers uh batters do it as well so so for me it, it's 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 a big technical red flag there first of all and i think that's why the guys don't have those options they're not used to it and they don't have that that makeup and you'll see like guys that have been around they sort of understand they've they've gone through the tough tours, you know. They, they've yeah. they've they've had to endure a few things. Um, I think it helps having senior players in the in the team that uh, can show. You know, for me, the biggest thing, you know, is I've played or whatever it is, but I think I got more value out of being a senior player, batting with the guy there for five overs than than coaching. 
in the nets for you know five sessions, whatever it is. Yeah. It's the same as uh, same as bowling with a senior senior bowler. You know, you can have the best bowling coach in the world, but how good is it to have your senior bowler that you're bowling with at the, at the same time at mid off chatting yeah. to you and then seeing what he does it. So, so it's also sort of just it, it's you know you, you, unfortunately you have to go through through those tough times. Um, but I think having guys that pick up and having guys that are giving you that solution straight away or giving you that, that, that that's great. So playing with some quality players, having a, I don't know, maybe having a, a, a batting coach that's had to go through the bad times or, or whatever it is. So, you know, I, I think that those solutions, that's the biggest thing is like having that yeah. set. You know, some guys want to come out. I mean, I've had some guys look at me like, geez, like, I don't know where I'm going to get my next run from here in terms of that. And then you have to like sort of break it down. And then all of a sudden seeing the confidence come back. And, and that's rewarding yeah. as a coach. Because, I mean, we, we don't, uh, you're going to cricket coaching. We're not, we're not football managers. We, we don't get yeah. too much, uh, too much praise or whatever. So if you're going to get yeah. to, to get praise and uh, all the sort of attributes here, you're in the wrong sort of, uh, coaching cross business. So that's rewarding for me is when when you can give the solution and the guys pick up and all of a sudden they feel that you know you've made an impact in that game. Um, you know with the spin as well, I think a lot of the times we uh, you know we understand that the bowler is also under pressure. You know if you're playing on a huge spinning wicket, that bowler is under pressure. He's got to take wickets. Same as yeah. you're playing a seamer and he's playing on a green wicket. You you know to try and Tell your players that, you know, that guy's under pressure as well. You know, you're playing on a seeming wicket and he can't find his length. And every time he drags it slightly short, you're hooking him and pulling him for four. He's under the pump. You know, yeah. we're on a, on a flat wicket. He's actually thinking, okay, well, I'm under the pump here. And he's, and, he, and he's keeping things a lot more simple, hitting some decent areas where he's expected. So always looking for that opportunity. And yeah. I think what we can do is, uh, uh, when we play spin is to put the guy under pressure. Why do we want to stand in the same place the whole time? Yeah, you know, why don't we dictate? So if you're playing an off spinner and the guy generally you're facing an off spinner, he's hitting fourth stump, turning in. That's generally what he's trying to do. If you go to off stump and you play a forward defence straight, if he hits you, it's outside the line. Yeah. First of all, now what you're trying to do, you're dictating. Now if you've got a good set, when he bowls his good ball and it's slightly short, you rotate, you're getting back onto your stumps and you're knocking him square for one. Now the captain's abusing him because. He's on a he's on a, a, a turning wicket and he's and this guy's rotating him strike easy. Now all of a sudden yeah. he's starting to bowl slightly wider at you, and when he bowls wider at you, it's bringing in your sweep, it's bringing in your reverse sweep. Um, you know, so I, I would be very sort of pushing guys to, and that's where you can go practice. Is like okay, this guy's got you under the pump. The guy he's bowling really well to you. You look like all C. Let's try. Let's see what he does when you bat on off stump, or let's see what he does when you bat outside leg stump, and yeah. sort of ask questions with the players there as well, where they can actually get into a thing. Well, like, and then and then you have your discussion afterwards. You say like, okay, well, uh, uh, Pangi, you had me dead there now, and all of a sudden you gave me some freebies. I hit you over extra cover. What were you thinking? He said, no. Well, you showed me your stumps. So I started yeah. going flatter and quicker for your stumps. Now you're not getting the bounce and the turn that you were getting earlier. Now I can hit you through cover or go over cover yeah. or on, on, on off stump. You know, if a bowler can't see your stumps, what do they do? They come at you. So if you're playing yeah. on a green wicket and you're batting on off stump, everybody wants a target. You know, if, if you're shooting a gun or shooting an arrow or whatever, you want to see a target. Now, yeah. if you're playing at the Wanderers and it's all in the bowler's favor and it's green, Standing on off stump, don't show the guy his, his stumps. He's going to hold out their fifth, sixth stump for a while, which is not asking any questions. And I guarantee you, you're going to get your half volleys because he wants to come and hit yeah. your stumps. Yeah, no, 100%. No, thank you for answering that. That, that gives a lot of clarity in that. Um, there's another thing that I would like to add on to there for, for the coaches that maybe Neil alluded to in the beginning that, that I felt was a big lesson you know, in that short little four-week tour to, to, to India um, with, with a lot of young and raw, raw players, is the, the reaction to a play and miss in South Africa of a seamer is very... When we, when we, when we play and miss of a seamer, it's, oh, oh well, well, bald. But when we play and miss against spin in the subcontinent, we hit the panic button. So 
maintaining that equ- emotional equilibrium when the ball beats your bat in the subcontinent against a good spinner on a Bunsen burner, it's like a seamer in South Africa at the Wanderers at the beginning of the season beating your outside edge. It's it's it, it, If you can get yourself thinking like that, you'll be able to score the ugly single to get off strike. You won't be bothered too much by the noise that happens around you. And, and that's what causes these pressures from our players. We can tell them till we blew in the face. Remember, there's going to be a silly point. We simulate it. There's going to be a short leg. There's a leg slip. There's a slip. There's going to be guys laughing at you. Even put the speaker next to the net and making a noise. But the reaction is not caused. The poor shot isn't caused by a good ball. It's actually caused by the reaction to everything happening around the player. And that those are the challenges that we need to allow these guys to learn and, and face. But for me to... To equate it for a player, I would, I'd like to say, when you play and miss against a spinner in the subcontinent, it's the same as you playing and missing against a seamer in South Africa. Just react the same way. I don't know what no, your thoughts are no, on no, that, Mikey. No, that's that's a hundred. In fact, that's what I say the whole time. To be honest, is is like, and I try and say it. It's reverse in Bangladesh. You know, when the spinner goes past them, they're like. That's normal everyday stuff. As soon as a seamer goes past them, they're like, "What's going on?" What I do, what I do say is like that's where the technical side of things and your game plan comes into it. So, you know, if you're playing against the off spinner and you've got in front of your pad and it hasn't turned and it's beaten you, and where you're standing on, you can't get you out, but you've held your line. So, what do we do as coaches in South Africa when, when we talk about the seamers going to? We know the seamers are going to play and miss. You're going to play and miss against the seamer. But what we do want is guys playing late and holding your line. If you yeah. start following the ball, that's the problem. So, so for me, it's, it's exactly what you've said, but I want to see technically that you've held your line. You know, yeah. when you start getting that little following the ball at the Wanderers, you know there's a technical side that's come in. And the same thing yeah. that happens in the subcontinent, you know, when you see a ball uh, sort of do something and you react and follow where you just want to hold your line. You want to play nice under your eyes. You want to be nice and late. Hold your line. It's going to beat you. And you're dead right. You, you know, you've got to expect to be beaten. You've got to expect that. But then it comes back to my other point as well, is that if you're in a 19 and you go to the subcontinent for the first time, it's, you've given them all the stuff to expect, but you've got to, go, you've got to hit that bad ball for four. Yeah. And that's what the good players do. You know? So all the noise, all the beating, whatever – you can get beaten two or three times and over and you've hit a four, but you've held your line. You've hit a four, you're suddenly you're still going okay. So it's an important fact to, to still look for that opportunity, be in that set position to take advantage of the bad ball. Yeah. No, 100%. Thank you for that, Becky. That's, that to me is, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we've discussed, um, but that to me is, if we're going to coach guys to to be strong against spin, have strong minds, um, and because you need a strong mind against against on, on a day fourth innings um, of a three day game or a four day game or a test match, um, those are the little principles that we, we'd like guys to 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 remember. Um, have I still got you on the line, Mackie? Yeah, I'm here. So let's let's talk current and progressive. Sorry, sorry, sir. Can I come in there? Um, yes, sir. Um, I see that obviously. Our time is the time that I've allocated. It's slightly going, and uh, probably we're left with about seven seven minutes. So can we obviously, as we busy trying to answer these questions, can we also obviously um, try to 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 be a bit quicker? Um, and we have to do it within the seven minutes, basically, um, so that yeah. we can wrap up. No worries. I'm gonna maybe try hit Mackie with these as quick fire. So modern day times, three team cricket coming up next week. Uh, we Noel has asked with the continuously with the continuously evolving happenings within the game. Where do you see the game in ten years? The goodie. Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> Moving fast, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think you know. You just look at what what T Twenty does. You know, like when back in the day when the one day uh, game came out and people said they were going to be in color clothing and all that sort of stuff, you know, you've obviously got people that are skeptical. I don't think you can be skeptical anymore. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, you know, entertainment world keeps on changing. 
I think the fundamentals of cricket don't change. Um, I think there's still the principles that you you've got to sort of acquire um, the skill levels. You know, with T20, we've seen it. You know, it used to be a hit and giggle. It used to be sort of like, okay, well, the 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 powers that be are, are wanting to make more money or whatever it is. So I don't know where we're going to be in 10 years. I hope Test cricket is still alive and well. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, it's such a great game. Um, and as I said, the principles don't change. The, the, the fundamentals of the game don't change. Whether it's three teams, four teams, eight teams, whatever it is, there'll be the odd change of rule. There'll be a stand that you can hit that's going to give you an extra two runs. Uh, you'll nominate whatever it is. Maybe baseball, you can point to where you're going to hit, and if you hit it, you get 12. I don't know. But generally, cricketers are cricketers. Yeah, no, 100%. So I'm gonna, I am gonna, might skip a couple, and hopefully I'm not going to offend anyone. Um, but I think this will be a pertinent one to help a, a coach here. How do I get my players to own their game? To own their game. Yeah. So maybe a, to be accountable. I'm, I'm assuming that that's what the coach is asking me. Here. Um, to be accountable for, for, for their game or their game plan. Um, well, I think it, it's sort of identifying his game plan first. So having the guy actually say what's his strengths, what's his weaknesses, what he's looking to do, having those like important conversations. And then owning his game is, is, is having a critique of the you know, every innings or whenever it is, uh, could be practice. How did you sort of attain? What would, out of 10, how would you give yourself for your, your practice in terms of uh, game plan, in, uh, in, in terms of uh, intensity, in, ten, in terms of tactics, thinking, whatever it is? So I think the ownership comes when you actually make him accountable and he can't mess you around. You know, he can't say, yeah. geez, I was backing myself, coach, because that's that's the favorite word at the moment. No, nah, geez, I backed yeah. myself. I was going over the top. Why were you going over the top? You didn't need to go over the top. No, yeah. coach, I was going over the top to get mid off back so I could rotate the ones because we needed seven and over and I just needed one boundary. So talking yeah. sense, you know, and I think, you know, you, you've got to show these players that they, they can't, you know, sorry, I'm, only word I can find is bullshitting you. So, <laughs> no, you know, because all, all, all us cricketers love it. I mean, we, we, we do it all day. We, we do it when we're padding up. We, we tell ourselves it's not a huge uh, pressure situation. We, we're very used to doing it. So, I think the ownership comes is when you've identified his game plan, he knows his game plan, and, you know, and for him to be aware that, you know, it's, it's, it's his game, but it, it affects the team when he goes outside his game plan. And he's been selected for that role, for his game plan, what he brings in. And if he can't yeah. execute that game plan, uh, he'll soon know that, you know, he's not going to get, he's not going to get the success he wants and, and you as a coach uh, might move on. So I think yeah. it's just getting these guys to know their game plan, being aware of their game plan and you being aware of their game plan. So when they go away from that game plan, what was their thinking? Yeah. No, thank you for that, Mackie. So the next quick one, um, this I'm going to try get two in. Um, I think you may have answered this one in the in the last question. How do you go about helping a player who relies on instinct without hindering their instincts or introducing doubt and fear in the way they bat or play? How do you manage that type of player? Um, well, I think those are the guys exciting. I mean, as we said, we we want. Different play, different players, or different style of players in every team. For me, it goes straight away as well. You know that instinct is is what ball you're trying to hit. You know you want that flair, you want that, you want that sort of attackingness. Um, you've got to be in a good position. A guy like Riley Rousseau, technically, is in a good position. He's probably in one of the best positions you've seen the whole time, yeah. and that allows him to play some outrageous shots. So there's frustrations that come with those sort of players. But it's him identifying his game plan as well. It's like when he goes away from a technical flaw. You know, you can be talented and flair, but you've got a technical makeup. You know, it yeah. might not look, it might not look like the, the the general technical play, but you as a coach have got to spot that and to say, okay, yeah. when it goes wrong, okay, well, listen, you were trying to hit that over the top. This is how you normally hit it over the top. Technically, you weren't in the right position this time. So technically, those type of players have to be in better positions than most other guys. To, yeah. to be able to um, 
sort of uh, get that flare technique, a sort of flare aggressive play out. They've got to probably be in the best positions possible. Mm. And so for them to realizing that that's the, the situation and and choosing the right ball, shot selection and, and, and situation. You know, I think the guys will mature. You know, a guy like Quinton de Kock, he used to just come out there, blaze your Vaughn von Jarsfeldt or whatever it is. They're very talented, hit the ball a long way. Batting, making them understand that situation. You're not taking, you're not yeah. going to moan at them when they get out doing a certain thing, but always saying, okay, well, you could have done this and then you could have hit that guy for 20 or whatever it is. Yeah. Giving them, just keep giving them options. Yeah. No, 100%. Um, so one more here from a young, uh, young aspiring uh, cricketer. Why does Kohli and Sanjun Samson, etc., not sweep? But we as young youngsters in South Africa are taught to sweep against good spinners. Um, well, first of all, I mean, he's been brought up on those wickets um, and the way he plays them. If you just look at his set, um, you know, he, he's a remarkable player. I think uh, you look how he hits the ball. He looks how he rotates. Um you know, I think he's just put it in that way. He's got two... For, for him, he's weighed up the... The, the, the risk and the reward and he's decided that you know by playing down the ground by, by playing sort of with the spin down the ground um, and sort of being in those positions he doesn't need a sweep you know I, yeah. I often think that he'd and it's hard for me to say is that if he had a sweep you see in the IPL sometimes as well he definitely gets caught out when the guys play against the, the better spinners and then he yeah. relies on the bigger shots where I think he's got quite a few skilled shots in terms of the reward. If he had to get onto off stump and, and have that little paddle or the sweep, uh, and that's, uh, uh, believe me, that's definitely, I'm not trying to coach Virat Kohli here. Uh, yeah. like is, he's an unbelievable player. But everybody's got his makeup. Everybody's got their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, like AB, as you look at AB spin play, you look at, um, you know, there's there's many players around the world that sweep really well. A guy like Kane Williamson plays spin really well. Um, there's a lot of guys that, that go about it a certain way. Uh, yeah. And, and that's his that's his format. Okay. We might be able to, to steal one more there, Kochi. Um, and this is the last one for the evening. Uh, Mark Kobane asks, what has been your approach in coaching the Bangladesh side between red ball and white ball squad and players? Knowing Bangladesh are more of a white or white ball players or suited to that, and red ball is is pretty much not not necessarily they're not performing as well at it. What's your approach in getting them to do do well with red ball cricket? Yeah, well, well, the first thing is I've only been their white ball coach for a while. I've done a couple of preparations for them, so with with the red ball, um, so it's been quite tough. It's been quite interesting. It's been nice being, as you said, they better white ball players, but they've got huge hunger. They've got huge sort of aspirations to to compete around the world. For me, you know, it's it's playing that short ball. They've got granite. You must actually see how they train. They've got this granite that they sort of like a kitchen top. They come and they put it there. And then they bowl bowling yeah. machines off the ball, so it bounces. So we've done yeah. a lot of work with, with the short ball stuff. Um, but the biggest thing is that technical flaw with that front foot coming forward. So um, I'll try and get it together in terms of maybe send it to, to Sia and Dumela. Um, is actually, we've put a sort of a big sort of uh, um, sort of video analysis of how they've played the short ball. And yeah. you just see that front foot the whole time. And you know, just front foot, keep coming forward, keep getting. And, and as a test nation, you know, away from home, if, you, if, you, if you're getting out to the short ball, you're going to just get more of the same. And that becomes yeah. bad technique, bad mental. And, and, and at that stage, it's trying to get them out of it mentally um, to compete. So the belief, you know, the, the brain is a, is a very uh, complex uh, and oiled yeah. machine. Their belief yeah. in their one-day cricket is unbelievable. Their belief in their test cricket is, is not not great because they all start thinking about the short ball, um, but it's changing. They've got some 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 hard, aggressive uh, young players coming through. Uh, yeah. Their biggest thing for me coaching them is their willingness to learn. Like even their best players, you know, very res sort of responsive, want to ask questions, yeah. and they all know that that short ball is 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 a 
is a problem. So they all yeah. sort of live, like live with whatever you say. So the the future for them is it's going to take a while. Probably they probably are five ten years off. Um, that still with with a few of their players coming through consistently they'll they'll hopefully have a good one or two away series in the next year or two but i think yeah. consistently it, it's going to have to be sort of a culture thing um but there's a few young aggressive some some stronger guys coming through yeah no mackie that's 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 awesome actually because just the whole session i just also while you were chatting we were chatting i just read through some of the messages um, again, the information has been priceless. There's no coaching manual that you can go to to get the feedback and the information that you've shared with us today and your experiences. Um, so just on behalf of Central Karting Lines, I know we we're a bit spoiled. We we have a bit of we have a bit of a shoe into to getting access to you when you are around um, and, and and developing our, our our players and 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 the minds and interacting with them. So thank you very much for that. I think you've helped a lot of us as coaches. Um, myself and Dumile included in that. Um, it's been a really enjoyable session and I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one where I've heard that you're going to be presenting something for us. So I'll let you deal with the technology for a couple of, uh, couple of weeks and, and, and plan with PowerPoint. <laughs> but um, it's been really quality, Neil. Um, you've, you've, you've touched a, a lot of buttons where you know, it, it just invigorates us to think a little bit broader as coaches um, and, and, and think wider as to how we can help our players. Um, and also our players, just to understand that from an ex-player, what the processes you followed were. And you spoke a lot about game plan. You spoke a lot about execution um, of that game plan, um, about setting yourself up in, in a strong position always. So those drills then come into effect during this lockdown period, it's doing those stationary drills, um, ball in a sock, um, getting yourself set, putting yourself in a scenario in your head. So all those little things that you've, you, those tools that you've given to, to us are definitely going to use and hopefully it will improve our system and, and improve our, our, our cricket as a, as a country and as a whole. No, thanks. Thanks for having us. Guys are obviously passionate uh, about the, the area. Um, so nice to have a chat and, and help out. Um, obviously prefer to be a, a practical uh, uh, example. Better than than over the the technical technological yeah. flaws here, but uh, thanks for having us. And yeah, I think you know as coaches you got to keep learning. Uh, we all learn the whole time, um, but it's it's great that guys are are happy to sort of share information. And I think that's what it's all about, you know, uh, sharing information and trying to impact every player's uh, game, whether it's a mental side, technical side, just just identifying that player and identifying what he needs. No, absolutely. Uh, it's the best one I've been involved in. No, uh, it was, it was, it was the best one. I really, I think, I think for me, you know, that like I've learned a lot in this past two hours, um, and it was, it was a, honestly the great session that we've had so far. I'm really grateful, and thank you, Neilman, uh, for giving us this opportunity, and and also um, coming to present us. And I think that this has added a lot of um, value. Um, to us as coaches, and I see obviously on my WhatsApps that the guys, um, they really appreciate the session. Um, it added a lot of value. So thank you very much, sir. And thanks to your family for allowing you to give up some time um, to be with us and joining us here. And I just want to that. take the opportunity to say thank you to everyone that has joined us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, thank you, thank you, and thank you. I will be sharing um, the videos as soon as... Um, um, it's done recording, so uh, whoever that started the recording, if I can't save it, please save it for us um, so that we can be able to share it with those that had um, uh, challenges with low shedding. Neil, thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate your time, sir, and I'm looking forward Neil, to our thanks next session. Joe. Thank you, Neil. Have a good evening. Cheers, guys. Thanks, sir. Cheers, cheers. Thank you. The bear, I see you coming on there. Do me. Yes, you Thank you to you and Sia. It's been a long session, yes, but I'm here. The old man is still here. And uh, <laughs> I sincerely hope, and obviously, as, as the time goes on, a lot of guys would leave and go, but um, that's understandable. They've got other things on. But those that have stayed on uh, and looking at the names and the initials, and I've seen some of the names, lovely to see Penner and all the guys there, and I see Mark Barney and all the boys. So it's wonderful to see all that and uh, see that the guys are prepared to learn. 
And uh, I may not be in my in my old position anymore, but I want to tell you something that I've had some fantastic uh, experiences with some of these seminars, and it's wonderful to see the willingness of the young coaches who want to learn. And this is here. You summed it up. You can't go buy a manual like this. This is free gratis for nothing, and they're getting from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So congratulations, you guys. Thanks for having us on, and I'm glad that one or two of the guys had managed to link on because I sent them that stuff late today, Jimmy. But thanks very much for having us, okay? Thank you, Bear. Cheers. Go well, guys. Cheers, cheers. Thanks, guys. How is it? How is it? <laughs> Jimmy, I'm trying to make sure we we find this recording because I didn't record, but I think Upra Wanele or may have be said we we were recording. Yeah, because I want I want to try and save it. I, I don't want to save I it. didn't. So if you look on. there on top, it says the recording has started. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I don't know who recorded it. Oh. Let, let's hope they say it. Right? Okay, Rafik Ishmael, it says. Oh, Rev. Yes, thank you, Rev. Thank uh, you. Please, Rev, make sure you save it. As some belief. Okay, I'll officially put that down as one of our best sessions ever. Yeah, it has been. It has been. It has it's been gone one of to our, our YouTube channel as the uh, master class. We'll definitely make sure, sir. Yeah. Eupra Markin and Jebe. They look down. Yeah. You, know, you know me and master classes. Yeah. Leader, you're going to put it on for us on that YouTube where everyone can see us in the world. The A. That's why you must no. scratch your toes. No, the content <laughs> was unbelievable in terms of what he gave us. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's different. I mean, I spoke to some players early on in lockdown. Uh, for players to relate to a coach's point of view, JP was good. I mean, JP was quality, but it was more on a mental sort of spiritual side um, for players. Um, but this was just next level in terms of the cricket aspect, the mind, um, yeah. and also for us as coaches, just some some really key things that we can take forward to to these young players. Yeah. I mean, that's what I've been seeing as well, that technical aspect of the game. You know, you can prepare mentally, you can do stretch sessions and that, but on the field itself, it requires a different approach. And that's my start for today. No, thank you very much, gentlemen. Mr. Skade, we'll uh, we'll have our debrief uh, tomorrow whenever you want, sir. Perfect, sir. Perfect. Uh, Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And thank you for for today, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Uh, Uh, Kowalski. Um, for, for, for attending, sir. I really appreciate um, seeing you here. Um, thank you very much, Lida. Thanks, gents. Thanks, Debza. Thanks, Tamax, for the support. It was awesome, guys. Yeah, <laughs> 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 We need to pick our arc, get an archive going. Prawanella wants an archive of uh, all our coaching stuff and what we do, That's videos cool. and all that stuff. I will cool. definitely I'll share do. with all those that I have. I will definitely share uh, from 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 um, to who's this guy, Enoch, um, Russell, Domingo, yes. all those. I will definitely share them. Yeah. And I, I see Coach and Henry from, uh, I think, Uganda or Ghana, one of the two. Um, he's joined us late. Um, Coach Henry, I will make sure that I share um, the whole session that you've missed, sir. Thank you, James. Bye-bye. Thank you, James. I can sure. safely end this meeting. Can I? Yes, end sir. The Thank you, Domi. Where's the whiskey? Where's the bubbles? We did mean I'm just so cool, man. I'm excited. We did fly. I'm we're going to be able to spend it. So how do we go about this?